the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, one God. Amen. Brothers and sisters in Christ, with the most humble of hearts, I greet you all. I hope everyone is having a good day or evening, wherever you may be watching this from. And I hope also everyone is having a wonderful start to Zemanetsugi, or the season of the flowers, as it is referred to in our church. And by the grace of God, we will be learning from the prophecy spoken by the prophet Hosea in Hosea chapter 11, verse 1, where the Lord God speaks, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. So as we all know, we celebrate Zemanetsugi, or the season of the flower. And during this season, we commemorate the plight of the Holy Family, meaning our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary, along with St. Joseph, St. Salome, as well as our Lord and our God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, where they had to flee from King Herod. They had to flee from Israel to Egypt, as well as to Ethiopia. And during this season, we refer to it as Zamanetsugi, or season of the flower, firstly because we have just finished or we have just concluded the season of winter uh, back in Ethiopia, back home. Um, while we were in the summer uh, in Ethiopia, it was winter time. It was a time of a lot of rain, um, similar to how we experience winter here. And as we all know, after winter comes spring. And during spring is a time when the flowers begin to bloom, when uh, the crops start to yield, the time of harvest. It's a time of hope, generally for people, for farmers, uh, and such. And similarly, this season of the flowers, Zemanetsugi, is a time of hope. It's a time of hope for us as well within the church. And we also refer to it as Zemanetsugi because we resemble uh, our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary, as a flower. We resemble her as a flower. Because a flower, when it blooms, it yields fruit right a flower when it blooms it yields fruit and our holy lady uh virgin mary yielded the true uh, fruit of life which is our lord and our savior jesus christ now when we go back to the topic of the plight of the holy family into uh, egypt from israel there's different various reasons why we commemorate this as such a, as such a special occasion within the church. And there are so many different things that we can take away from this one story alone. Now, let's first uh, go through a recap of what exactly took place. So we know that uh, after our Lord Jesus Christ was born, there were three wise men who came from the East to uh, worship our Lord Jesus Christ and to give him gifts. And so on their way, uh, following that star, on their way to Bethlehem, they stopped at Jerusalem and they spoke to King Herod. They spoke to King Herod. And um, King Herod, essentially, he tells those three wise men that once they find him, to refer back to him so that he may also go and worship our Lord Jesus Christ. However, as we know, that was not the true intention that King Herod had. His true intention was to go and uh, kill our Lord Jesus Christ because he was currently the king at the time. So hearing the news of another king being born, um, you know, this was uh, a bit of pride on King Herod's part. And so after the, the three wise men, they reach Bethlehem, they give those three gifts, the frankincense, the gold and the myrrh but before they begin their journey an angel appears to them and tells those three wise men to not go back to jerusalem because king herod actually he did not want to worship our lord jesus christ but instead he intended to kill him and so the three wise men found another way back to their country and king herod knowing that the three men did not come back, he was furious and he decreed that all uh, children, all male children, two years and younger, 
in the town of Bethlehem to be executed. He issued a decree. And so an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph and he tells Joseph to flee to Egypt until he is told to come back. And so Joseph, taking our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary, taking our uh, the baby, our Lord Jesus Christ, and taking Saint Salome, he takes them and they flee to Egypt according to the command of the angel. And through this, we learn three very important, very important lessons. The first lesson that we learn is uh, the lesson to have faith in divine commandments. We learn to have faith in divine commandments. And we learn this through Joseph. So Joseph, he was a carpenter by trade. So, but he was from uh, Bethlehem. He was from Judea. So he was, he was uh, a Jew before uh, the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ. And so he grew up essentially hearing and expecting, hoping for the coming of the Messiah. That was the main prophecy that a Messiah would come to save the Jewish people. And obviously the Jewish people, they were expecting this, they were waiting for this. And Joseph, uh, he he's essentially has been told by uh, by God, by the angel, that this is the Messiah, this is the king that is supposed to uh, save the Jewish people. But now all of a sudden he hears that he has to flee to Egypt because uh, King Herod, the current king at the time, is seeking to kill our Lord Jesus Christ. So if, if any one of us were in Joseph's situation, we may question, like, if this is the kid that is supposed to save us all, uh, he cannot even save himself. That would be a question that may arise in uh, the minds of some of us who are weaker in faith than Joseph. Yet Joseph, without questioning, without questioning, he takes the Holy Family and they flee to Egypt. He simply obeys with faith. And that is what we learn from Joseph in this story. Many times we are told, whether directly or indirectly, to uh, do something. We are told by God to do something. Yet we, have, we always come up with some sort of complaint to not do it or we come up with some sort of excuse and even time and even most of the time it's not something that's necessarily difficult but rather inconvenient like imagine joseph excuse me imagine joseph he's being told to flee from israel to egypt by foot that's something that's uh, so uh, such a uh, very difficult and they did they didn't have any time to grab any food any water they had no supplies, but they just go straight to Egypt. Imagine how difficult that must be. But us, we are not even told to do something as difficult as this, but something rather inconvenient. Let's say uh, coming to uh, coming to uh, Gubai or some uh, conferences just to hear the word of God. Or we are, we are told to serve in some way. We are told to serve, like for example, uh, on Sundays as, you know, Wengil Masalam, uh, making sure everyone uh, kisses the gospel or uh, making sure everyone gets tzabal after taking Holy Communion. These are just very simple examples. But God, He may tell us to do other things as well. Maybe He is calling us to evangelize. Yet, these things are just minor inconveniences rather than something as difficult as fleeing uh, your entire uh, city. To a whole other country. But instead, we come rather than obeying with faith, we come up with complaints or excuses so as not to do it. And so we learn through Joseph the importance of having faith and obeying divine commandments. The second main point that we learn from the story of the, the plights of the Holy Family to Egypt is we learn that spiritual warfare exists in service. We learn that spiritual warfare exists in service. 
And this is for anyone that is called to serve the Lord God. Spiritual warfare always exists. And this happens where whenever you try to begin to grow yourself spiritually, where you try to grow spiritually, you try to serve God in some way inside the church or outside of the church, you'll experience some sort of trials, some sort of tribulations. And an example of this is we learn through St. Mary in this example. St. Mary, her whole life, she essentially grew up in the temple from age three. She was brought into the temple and she grew up there until age 15 when it came time for her to uh, conceive and give birth to our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So she grew up in the temple. She did not know anything, uh, any worldly things, any worldly food, drinks, passions, worldly uh, temptations, anything like that. She didn't know anything, only the heavenly stuff. And even after she left the temple, um, you know, when she was given to be taken out, taken care of by Joseph, she, she was mainly, she stayed inside. She stayed uh, waiting to uh, give birth to our Lord Jesus Christ. She stayed in there with faith, with prayer. And that's uh, essentially all she knew in this world. But now all of a sudden, she is called essentially for the first time to leave her home and to travel. Uh, imagine an, an unbearable journey essentially from her country where she knew her whole life to a whole other land. And imagine the kind of uh, pain, the hunger, the thirst that she had to go through. And we, we know the stories. We hear them in uh, Tamara, Maram, the miracles of uh, the Virgin Mary, where she had to go through all of the hunger, the thirst, where it was even to the point where uh, they were robbed at one point in the middle of their journey. She has to go through all of this uh, struggle, this pain, this affliction as a result of being called to uh, this incredible service, which none of us can even imagine being called to. Yet some of us are called to serve in ways that may not even compare to this way that Our Lady the Virgin Mary was called to. But we, as soon as we are called to service of even a smaller stature, we may experience some sort of trials and tribulations. For example, those of us that serve as uh, deacons, uh, whenever, uh, whenever we have to go to church a lot of the time, we have to get up very early for service, for example. And many times uh, that service starts very early in the morning. And we all know that that feeling of trying to get up out of the bed sometimes, but you just you just can't get out of the bed. That's an example of a very simple example of uh, a trial, a temptation that a servant has to face. Another example is um, evangelism. Those who are called to evangelize, they may experience trials along the way. They may experience people uh, trying to uh, stop them from uh, teaching other people about the word of God. Or they may experience people who try to test their faith whenever they are teaching about the word of God. And we see these examples of people who suffer through trials and temptations just as a result of service. But what we should take away from this is that when we are called to service and if we experience trials, we should not lose heart. We should not lose faith as a result. Instead, we should expect it because we saw through the Virgin Mary that trials are a part of service. Spiritual warfare is a part of service. In fact, this is a, a recurring problem where some people even refuse to serve because of these trials, because of these trials, because th they may fear or they are scared of the trials that they may face. Yet, we shouldn't be one of those people. We shouldn't lose hearts as a result of experiencing trials and temptations because this is expected. This is a part of service. In fact, our Lord uh, Jesus Christ, he even tells his disciples that you will be persecuted, you will be ridiculed in my name. This is something that he literally tells his disciples if, uh, during uh, his ministry. So we should uh, take, we should uh, expect it. We should not lose hearts whenever we are called to serve and we experience some sort of trial or tribulation. 
And the, the third thing that we learned as a result of or through this event of the plight of the Holy Family is that not only for servants, but just living as a Christian on this earth comes with a hardship. Living as a Christian on this earth comes with hardship because we know that this home, this earth, this world is not our eternal home. We are not going to be here forever. This is just a temporary, a stopping point in our journey to the kingdom of heaven. This is just a temporary, almost like uh, almost like a, a hotel, if you think about it. You don't stay in a hotel forever. This is just a temporary uh, place for us until we reach the kingdom of heaven. And we see that life is uh, full of hardships for a Christian by nature. And we can refer back to the example of Joseph, who we see experiences this sort of up and down, up and down uh, uh, life, where we, we obviously we said he is a carpenter by trade uh, before uh, and during uh, the life of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he is called to uh, be the caretaker to our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary, who is with child. And uh, Joseph, he, ex he is essentially, um, this is a very difficult situation for Joseph because uh, she is with child and he is bringing her into his home. And this was, to make it short, essentially seen as a sort of uh, uh, a blemish on his reputation in some way. And we even see in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 2 where Joseph, um, you know, he says like um, he is unable to take Mary into his home because she is with child and the angel reassures him, telling him that the child is of the Holy Spirit. And okay, so Joseph, he goes through this hardship number one where he takes her into his home and then eventually it becomes time for our Lady the Virgin Mary to give birth to our Lord Jesus Christ. And on that, uh, around that time, we see in the Gospel of Luke, uh, where um, there is a census that's being conducted and everyone has to go to their city of origin. And so they have to find a place in Bethlehem, where Joseph was from, to give birth to uh, our Lord Jesus Christ. But they are unable to even find a place to stay and they look all day and night, and eventually, the very last moment, they find a, a barn yard, a stable, a manger, where our Lord Jesus Christ is born. So he goes through this hardship. And then even after that, when, when the angel tells Joseph to flee to Egypt, uh, he has to take everyone without any preparation, without any supplies, food, water. And he has to take them uh, all of those miles just by foot to a whole other land where they had not even been before and where they don't even have a place to stay. So we see this continuously up and down cycle within Joseph's life just as a result of having faith in the Lord and obeying his commandments. And we see uh, similar cases even within our life not necessarily to the to the extent that uh, joseph uh, went through but even uh, simple hardships that we go through in our daily lives and this is not necessarily just in, within our spiritual life but even within uh, our worldly life like our academics for example our work uh, a lot of times maybe we may um, we may not do uh, well or as we expected on uh, academics for example or even in work, um, we may be, you know, some people may be laid off. Some people may have to take a pay cut. Just these uh, kinds of hardships that people go through. And a lot of times it becomes very difficult, um, you know, within this life here on earth. But what we must uh, take away is that if it is to the point, if it is where we are going through a hardship, we should remember that we should remember with faith that joy is coming. We should remember with faith that joy is coming, that that hardship is not going to last forever. And true eternal joy, the true eternal joy 
only comes in the kingdom of heaven, our final destination, our final goal. That is when we reach true joy, when we are eventually reconciled, reunited, uh, and live with God in the kingdom of heaven. But let's say we are going through a time of joy here on earth because it's not always going to be hardship. It's going to be a mix. It's going to kind of go back and forth between the times of joy and times of hardship. And if we are experiencing a time of joy, we should first be thankful, of course, uh, for the Lord God, for what he has done for us so that we are able to experience a time of joy. But we should also remember that that joy is not eternal. It's not permanent. It won't last forever. And we should consider that true joy will only come once we are reunited with God in the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> and the last uh, thing we should remember from this uh, event is that prophecy, we see that prophecy is fulfilled through the birth of, or through this uh, uh, story of the plight of the Holy Family. We mentioned the first prophecy by the prophet Hosea, chapter 11, verse 1, where he says, Out of Egypt I have <clears throat> called my son. And the other prophecy is uh, by the prophet Isaiah, prophet Isaiah, chapter 19, verse 1, where he says, The burden, uh, behold, the Lord rides on a swift cloud and will come into Egypt. The idols of Egypt will totter at his presence in the heart of Egypt will melt in its midst. So when he says the Lord rides on a swift cloud into Egypt, that swift cloud that the prophet Isaiah is referring to is our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary. Because we know that, um, just based on basic signs, clouds, uh, they carry water, right? Or water vapor that eventually falls down onto the earth as rain. And our Holy Lady, the Virgin Mary, is the swift cloud that carries the true water of life. Even our Lord Jesus Christ, he uh, refers to it in John chapter 4, where he says that uh, he is the, the living water, the living water. And she is the true uh, swift cloud that carries the living water. And she, uh, the Lord, our Lord Jesus Christ, rides with our Lady the Virgin Mary into Egypt. And it says, Behold, the idols of Egypt will totter at his presence. So before the coming of our Lord, Jesus Christ, Egypt was primarily a nation which uh, bowed down to idols, which worshipped idols. Um, we know the story of the, the Egyptian uh, mythology, the Egyptian uh, gods. I'm sure uh, most of us have read uh, books referring to that kind of stuff. And uh, these are the kind of idols that Egypt used to worship prior to the coming of uh, our Lord. And after our Lord uh, came and the Holy Family came into Egypt, Egypt essentially became a country that began to worship the Lord God. In fact, Egypt even became, became a safe haven for Christians and even became a place where Christianity expanded and grew. In fact, uh, some of the, the main uh, places, the main scholarly places of Christianity are in Egypt. It became a center of Christianity. For example, the school of Alexandria, where they studied scripture, that was in Egypt. And that was after, it was built after uh, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and after uh, Egypt began to worship our Lord uh, God. <clears throat> and uh, also the Holy Family not only visited Egypt, but also came to visit Ethiopia uh, as we see the prophecy in Habakkuk uh, chapter 3, Habakkuk chapter 3, verse 7, where uh, the prophet Habakkuk prophesies, prophesies the story of the Holy Family entering Ethiopia, our Lord Jesus Christ entering Ethiopia. And whenever they entered Ethiopia, the Ethiopian people who had already been worshiping uh, the Lord God through the constitution of the law and through the Old Testament, they honored the Holy Family. They showed them uh, true hospitality. They brought them into their house. They fed them. You know, they gave them water. They, they gave them somewhere to sleep. And they just showed this hospitality 
And even today, uh, a lot of our tradition is built on uh, holy tradition or built on scripture. And even today, we commemorate that or some households commemorate that by having, uh, you know, a feast, a banquet for the priests, the deacons, the clergy and the church to uh, eat. And this is kind of signifying or symbolizing the hospitality that was shown to the Holy Family whenever they entered Ethiopia. And so we see all of these very important uh, aspects and reasons as to why we commemorate this very special holiday. Uh, as we all know, the season of flowers or Zemanetsege ends on uh, Hidar 6 in the Ethiopian calendar or uh, the holiday known as Uskwam, where the Holy Family um, you know they make their they make their return to um, Israel and they rest on Mount Usquam uh, in Egypt and may the Lord God bring us uh, to the end of the season of flowers with peace and um, with faith may He give us grant us the blessings of the Virgin Mary during this special time this is a very uh, special time for people in the church. This is one of this is for deacons, for servants of the church. One of our favorite seasons of the year because there's Mahalit on Sundays, the from midnight service, um, where we sing those beautiful hymns, beautiful uh, whatevs commemorating the Virgin Mary and commemorating uh, our Lord Jesus Christ and their plight to Egypt. So may we all receive the blessings of the Holy Family during this special season. May the blessing of the Father, the glory of the Son the life of the Holy Spirit, and the intercession of the Virgin Mary, and of the saints and angels, be with all of you. Amen.